Hi, and I'm really sorry I can't be with you. Um, I was desperate, desperate to be part of this session, but I am uh, just stuck in Bristol for a few hours. It's incredibly inconvenient. Um, but what I would have shared with you is that I think that we face a climate emergency, um, but alongside that, what we need to face up to is that we face a political and an economic emergency as well. Um, by that, I mean unprecedented levels of inequality that in and of themselves, by the way they produce our elites and the, the backgrounds they come from, have built this system that have given us a climate emergency. Um, so I think one of the important things to do to, to, to think about in the climate movement is that it cannot be done without addressing politics, structural inequalities, uh, you know, the, the power structures that exist in our world at the moment. Unfortunately, sometimes that conversation's um, a, a bit absent. So we have to hold together all those emergencies uh, uh, for, this, for, for the sake of the hope of an inclusive movement that will be ultimately successful. I mean, in my city of Bristol, um, air quality, just like cities around the world and across the UK, is a, is a major challenge. Uh, 300 deaths a year is the number that, that is worked with publicly. Uh, but coming from a public health background myself, I know that deaths are the tip of the iceberg and the echoes into wider ill health uh, will flow out um, in, and, in, and, in and around that. Um, in, in Bristol, we've set our stall out to, uh, to uh, be a, a city that develops and grows without destroying the planet on which we, de we depend. Um, we've got a major house building program going on. That means that we're trying to build quality homes uh, that are uh, sustainable homes, but also in the locations so that they're in active travel areas. So we're building more densely, uh, more in the middle of the city as much as we can so that people are not building in car dependency. We're going through a bus deal that uh, is, will put us on track to having 100% biogas buses that are more frequent, more regular, and hopefully we'll be able to transition people onto the buses, including developing a ring of park and rides again to, to, to cut down on the commuter pressure on the city. We are developing plans for an underground spot of mass transit uh, system uh, for Bristol as well. Uh, so lots going on, that's our, our, you know, our real big stuff. Uh, we've also obviously uh, come in to, to target for a clean air zone, which we need to deliver. To be frank, that's been a really uh, challenging process. It's, as I keep pointing out, while it's being used as a political football, it's a technically challenging process because it's a technical exercise to work out how you reach compliance across just nine streets in, in the shortest possible time. And we couldn't work out why some of our streets were proving a real problem, maybe to do with the topography of the city uh, and, and, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, but we, we have now come with a solution that will, we will, uh, you know, will bring us to compliance. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but uh, that's what we, one we have to take on. But we have to take it on in the face of other challenges that come from that, in that there are consequences uh, to delivering our cars. And this comes down to just a little bit of nuance, as I, I explain quite often, that good things can have negative consequences for some people. That doesn't stop them being good things, but that's the world is uh, a little bit complicated. So we had early warnings, early doors, that um, the implementation of Clean Air Zone could have a disproportionate impact on lower income people um, in particular. We've had feedback that it's going to have a disproportionate impact on uh, businesses and small businesses. And even our hospital trust in the middle of the city has written to me saying, they believe that any cost incurred by their suppliers will simply be passed to the hospital and will turn up as effectively as an NHS cut as their expenses increase. So we have to implement our clean air zone but doing all we can to take mitigating actions to make sure we're not worsening the plight of the lower income uh, people in the city, um, jeopardising the resilience of business who are already facing incredible uncertainty uh, from Brexit businesses who provide jobs for people that helps us tackle poverty uh, and also protecting our national health service. As I said, that doesn't take away from the legitimacy of tackling uh, the challenge of clean air, but it does say that we have to take action. And that's where government come in. Uh, my sense is that what we've had is all demand and all show and no support. Um, with UK 100, we met Michael Grove quite some time ago now, before this was all in the headlines, and we asked for a billion and a half extra uh, in, in the Clean Air Fund and support for a diesel scrappage scheme, transition scheme. He said no, we've had no further support. Um, I found that government has not been joined up. If you're serious about clean air, surely you would talk to DFT, you talk into the HIV process, uh, you begin to talk to the National Health Service and all those other departments that manage estates and produce carbon uh, and, and produce transport. So, uh, you know, I really uh, welcome some join up at the, uh, the national level. Um, so as I said, I wish I could be with you, 
we're taking on the challenge of a complicated city and we're absolutely committed to delivering, but we're committed to protecting the interests of the poorest and most vulnerable people in our city. Welcome everybody. I feel like this is now becoming a family occasion. We've been here about a month so far, haven't we? <laughs> or was, or was it a day? I don't know. Um, so we'll, for those who haven't met me yet, I'm Melanie Smallman. I'm one of the co-chairs with CIRA. And for those who don't know, CIRA is the environment campaign that's affiliated to the Labour Party. We are a membership-based organisation and we pay for events like this and our campaigning um, through, of course, some sponsorship, but also through the money which members pay in donations and in membership fees. So if there's anyone here who isn't a member and is enjoying the sandwiches, then maybe think about joining up here. Um, we have membership forms, or you can do it online. You can do it online right now, sira.org.uk. So, welcome to our um, event on Labour cities cleaning up our air. Every year now it's become traditional that we have an event about air quality. Um, it would be nice if we didn't have to have events about air quality that because everything was so great, but until it is, we're going to keep on keeping on about it. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Polly. There's just one more thing that I should say, because I'll forget at the end, is that it's the CIRA rally at six o'clock in this room this evening, so if you would like to come back for that, you would all be very welcome. So, I'm going to hand over now to Polly Billington, who is Director of UK 100, but also a member of the CIRA Executive. Thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, thanks and welcome, everybody. Um, yes, as Melanie says, I'm Polly Billington. I'm the Director of UK 100, which is a network of local leaders from across the UK who have committed to 100% clean energy and are acting on clean air and climate. It's the only network of its type um, in the country. And if you check on our website, www.uk100.org, and you can't find your local authority, then get them to sign up, because we've now got 95 members. Um, and it would be lovely if we get to 100 by the end of the year. Um, this, uh, we, uh, UK 100 is sponsoring this event for the very reason that Clean Air is a key campaign for us, which has come from our own leaders, which include the two gentlemen on, on either side of me, and indeed Marvin uh, Rees, the, the Mayor of Bristol, who was supposed to be here, and we were supposed to have a video from him, but the technical interlude did not result in success, I'm afraid to say, but we will have that web, that. Um, video from Marvin on our website. He was unable to attend today. He kindly sent us a video and we will make sure that that's available on the CIRA website. But I'm delighted to be joined uh, this afternoon by two of the most, uh, the most ambitious and progressive local leaders on tackling air quality that we have in our network and I would argue therefore across the country. Um, on my right we have Steve Rotherham who is the Mayor of Liverpool City Region. That is distinct from quite what it says on the screen, as the mayor of Liverpool is the city, and Steve is, is mayor of Liverpool City Region, which makes up seven, the city, six, six um, metropolitan boroughs. What, what, what those of us in old money would have described as Merseyside, almost, yeah. or in fact, exactly. Um, and Steve will tell us a little bit about what he's been doing in um, Liverpool uh, City Region on clean air. So I won't, I, I, he needs no further instruction from me, apart from the fact, of course, he used to be an MP, but decided that sometimes you just need to get on with stuff. Um, and those of us in local government know exactly what that's like. And I'd also like to um, introduce Phil Glanville, who's a good friend of mine. Um, he's by my boss, so that's kind of a bit weird. Um, I'm a councillor in, in Hackney, so I have, to do, I have to be on my best behaviour. Um, while Phil is here, but it's really great to have him here to talk about what he's been doing um, in Hackney, which is again one of the most uh, polluted parts of the country and um, with some of the poorest um, uh, people alongside some of the richest. Um, uh, we are, you know, 20 minutes bike ride to Westminster if you're going really fast uh, in a lot of lycra, uh, which some people do. Um, and yet there are still some of the, ma the biggest um, inequalities in terms of health outcomes um, as well as um, environmental um, challenges in that borough. So um, I'm, I've been campaigning on climate for a long time and we realised quite early on when we were dealing with clean air that people were talking about it breaking legal limits and we realised that as unsurprisingly in these post-Brexit days almost um, people are less worried about breaking the law than they are about their health. And fundamentally, 
air pollution is a public health crisis and we need to act accordingly. So it's great. Um, if you would like to be tweeting about this, um, you will find all of the Twitter handles of the people around you. I think uh, they're not up there, so you, will be, um, you should be able to hunt them quite easily. We'd like you to be able to tweet out about this and make sure that people hear what we are saying um, on this issue. And we also know that this is a social justice issue. That's one of the reasons why CIRA exists, is because we believe that you can't achieve environmental justice without social justice, and you can't achieve social justice without environmental justice. Other political parties are free to make other decisions, but that is the one that the Labour Party makes, and makes a big difference to the kind of uh, solutions we come up against. It's worthwhile thinking about this in the context of the future. By 2030, that's literally in just over 10 years' time, we're expected to have 70 million people living in the UK, 92% of them in towns and cities. Therefore, very, very vulnerable to air pollution unless we transform the way, fundamentally, we move around, as that is one of the biggest um, contributors to air pollution. And that also means thinking about things like some of our partners in local uh, decision-making, like the NHS, where one in four hospitals um, uh, are, in, uh, uh, are in an area which breaches um, air quality limits, and one in three NHS patients are registered as a GP where their, their surgery breaches in is an area which breaches those, those limits. So we need to be thinking about this in a whole system approach, which is one of the things we're particularly keen on campaigning about in the environment. So can I first turn to Steve? Steve, you've now been Metro Mayor of Liverpool City Region for three years, is that yeah, right? Yeah. Nearly three years. This was one of the first things that came up because of that legal case that Client Earth brought. Made the, it, it became very clear that the national government um, were in breach, but they were going to make this a local problem. How did you respond? Um, well, first of all, um, because of those technical difficulties, there are no subtitles, so hopefully you'll understand the Scouse accent. There are some, there are some expat Scousers here, so they, they'll get it. Um, <laughs> and also, I'm very cognizant of you know, that imposter syndrome, where there are people in the room who've forgotten more than you'll ever know about an issue, and I think that's what I'm faced with tonight. But um, we, we've got some powers. We actually got a devolution agreement and I know there's a differential understanding of what those agreements are, so if I just tell you our area, because it is what was called Merseyside with Holton, so it's Holton, those who live in Pilsen, Talon, Sefton and the Wirral, six areas, 1.6 million people, working together for the first time ever. Um, Greater Manchester have done great things because they've always had a collaborative way of working, so we're looking at what they've been doing and seeing what we can do more locally, taking those decisions for ourselves, and of course, one of the first things that we identified, uh, issues around health inequality, around air quality, around uh, what we need to do on the social justice issues. So I, from day one almost, uh, after spending two years as Jeremy Corbyn's PPS, said to, to Jeremy, what would you do? And he said, I'd have a body that oversees the development of, of policy. And so we've got something called FASJAB, which is the Fairness and Social Justice Advisory Board. And so all of our policy development goes through FASJAB, and that means that environmental consideration can genuinely be embedded into policy making. So it's not tokenism, you know, let's just pick a number out the air, which we didn't do when we said that we were going to be net zero carbon by 2040. And the reason that we picked that, that, uh, that date out is because we know that we'll at least get to there by 2040. Actually, it'll be a lot, a lot before 2040. And I'll tell you some of the reasons why, if that's all right, Polly. So, um, on transport, we are buying our own trains, 460 million pounds worth of brand new rolling stock, which are cleaner, greener, but more importantly, we're going to own them, actually bought and paid for by the people in the city region. And we were the first area to have our trains owned by our own people. So I'm going to have signs up that say, don't put your, seat, don't put your feet on the seat, because you wouldn't invite somebody round to your house and allow them to put them on your brand new couch. So don't be But I want people to understand that. They're ours, but they are more environmentally uh, friendly. They're also much more uh, accessible as well. But the whole host of benefits that come from that. And that's the first bit that we've done. 
And then there was a, an Act of Parliament, uh, the Bus Services Bill 2017, and that gives, although it's purposely almost impenetrable in bits, and it's convoluted and overly legalistic and all, but we're trying to get through that because we want to re-regulate our bus service. And why do we want to do that? Well, because actually London's got a fairly decent um, service, and that's because it's regulated. Boris Johnson, when he went as the Mayor of London, didn't deregulate the London bus service, but it was good enough for everybody else. Well, actually, if a regulated bus service is good enough for London, now guess what we're going to do? We're going to re-regulate ours. And that means we can pick the type of buses that we want to run okay. in the Liverpool City region. So we've just bought the first fleet of hydrogen buses, uh, £6.4 million worth. It's only 25, but it's a, it's a start of a process that I want to go through. And that alongside our hybrid buses means that we've got the youngest fleet of buses anywhere outside of London. So we want to tackle air quality that way as well, because in all honesty, those hydrogen buses, all they emit into the atmosphere is water vapour. So they're really, really good. And we, we want to do a lot more on that. We have invested in something called Alstom. Alstom's in a place called Widnes, which is in Holton. And they're going to manufacture hydrogen trains. And so they were going to have hydrogen trains uh, manufactured in our city region, again, through investments that we've made. And then we've got certain things that nowhere else in the country has got. We've got a huge offshore wind farm. We don't own it. Dong Energy uh, developed it. But who knows what we might want to do in the future. Um, but we've got the River Mersey, um, the lifeblood of what's happened in Liverpool and the city region for generations, for, forever, really and we're going to harness its power. And if there's anyone here from Swansea, genuinely, uh, I think it was it. Well, I think what happened there was a travesty um, in Swansea. But we've had to learn from the les lessons of Swansea. And so we're now developing with a, uh, a commission who was headed up by the guy who developed that offshore wind farm in, in, for Dong Energy. But we're developing this, we, we're uh, putting together this commission who are developing the project so that it doesn't fall through the same sort of pitfalls that um, Swansea had. And believe me, this is something that is not just doable, but it will be delivered, and, and we'll be the first to have tidal energy, which is as predictable as night and day, isn't it? So we'll know. Um, we've got the uh, National uh, Oceanography Centre that's based in Liverpool that tells you when the tides are. So we know in five years, in 10 years, in 100 years, how much energy we're getting from it. It'll, um, it'll be able to generate enough energy for a million homes in the Liverpool city region. It's the size of a nuclear power plant, a small nuclear power plant. And if we don't do it, the alternative is we're an area that's ripe for fracking. And so I'm saying we'll have a moratorium, we'll ban fracking. I guess why? Because we don't need it. We've got an alternative there called the Mersey, and we're going to do something on that. Um, and then we've got um, uh, hydrogen capture. Um, that we're already using. And there's a thing called um, Cadent High Net, and we're a pilot area, and they are pumping 15% um, of hydrogen into the natural gas supply in St Helens to trial this. Um, because, and then this, this really will split the room, Polly. Anybody who's sort of my age would remember when we went over from North Sea Gas uh, to North Sea Gas, and he used to come round your house. And they had to change all the, the elements in the, the fire and in the, the boiling and all that. And that's because um, it was a different um, way in which it ignited and, and burned at different temperatures. So we don't want to go through that in the Liverpool City region because that costs billions. But we'll get a percentage to the very highest that we can possibly get it to without the need for going and changing boilers and all that sort of stuff. So we're doing everything that we can possibly do but it's still not enough, of course, and we want to do more. But I'm sure that we'll tease out some of the other things that we want to do in the questions. That's really helpful. In com and obviously, you've got different powers as a London borough, not quite so many people, um, and very different challenges. What have you done with... Um, and how did you identify that it was a problem, and what did you do about it? Well, thanks, thanks Polly. And uh, uh, I'm not Polly's boss by any stretch of the imagination. Polly's actually my local ward councillor, so uh, <laughs> and, and, and uh, a very fine ward councillor uh, that you are too. Um, what, what I come at this from a sort of position, um, two positions, 
absolutely it's a social justice uh, issue. And I think uh, for the Labour Party, that must be front and centre of why we talk about it. Um, and if you look at the broader movement around climate change emergency, we must make very sure that we don't allow people to present it as a nice-to-do middle-class issue. It's actually at the core of everything we believe uh, as socialists. And I suppose I'll, I'll sort of go into um, why I think that. I didn't come to this necessarily naturally. I was a ward councillor before I became mayor in Hoxton. Um, you might think Hoxton is sort of swinging Shoreditch and all the nighttime economy and artists and all the rest of it. Actually, Hoxton is 70% social housing, one of the lowest car ownership uh, levels of anywhere in Hackney, but some of the dirtiest air because it's on the city fringe. It's an absolute microcosm of the challenge in London where the poorest communities are living with the dirtiest air and it's not of their creation. And as a ward councillor going into 2014 uh, local elections, we were drawing up five pledges. And my colleague, Councillor Williams, who's now in my cabinet, she said, we need to be starting to think about dirty air. And to be honest, nobody really got it. Nobody really believed her. Uh, but actually, that really started a dialogue locally at a ward level in Hackney around this sort of issue. And I think that's incredibly important. It's about communities taking back their air and changing their local urban environment. And you can do that at a city region level, you can do it at a council borough level in, in Hackney, or you can do it at a ward level, you can do it as an individual local um, council. I suppose what I would also say is there's a lot obviously here at conference about Labour's Green New Deal, but it means nothing if it isn't delivering practically on the ground to improve people's lives uh, in their communities. And I think that's what we've been doing as Hackney. And like Steve said, uh, firmly on the shoulder of giants. There's people in this room that have been part of the transition in Hackney to walking and cycling as our key modes uh, of transport. And Hackney, I suppose, had a bit of a, a sort of disadvantage advantage. It was never on the tube map. So people were used to buses, walking and cycling. Uh, and very progressive people that were thinking about these issues way before I became Hackney councillor, uh, never mind mayor, had started thinking about how do you filter neighbourhoods? How do you make them low traffic environments? How do you make them more better for walking and cycling? And I now actually have a privilege of living in a low traffic neighbourhood, which is where Polly uh, represents. I'd lived all of my life in Hackney before then on major roads and lived with that dirty air. And then when you move away from it and you know what everyone should be living uh, with, I think it's, a, a, in, it, you know, it's why we must do what we do. And I suppose the, 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 the other side of uh, that for for me, is that it's small things that start to make a difference. So people in Hackney had decided we were going to have car-free development, residential car-free development, probably earlier than almost anywhere else uh, in, in London. That meant we went through an immense amount of business growth and residential growth over the last two decades. You know, 100, 100 plus percent um, business growth, 30,000 new Hackney residents with a decline in car ownership. So you can have growth, but you can shape that growth uh, in a more progressive uh, way. And when I was elected in 2016, um, we really involved um, Sustrans, Living Streets, our cycling campaign in what became a mini manifesto. And then I took that process with the Labour Party and CIRA contributed to the main manifesto in 2018. And it was a, very much a supercharging of what we were doing uh, anyway. So increasing our investment in walking and cycling, um, continuing to do the filtering, and I think filtering and incremental change is incredibly important. You know, you, it can get into discussions around superhighways and like for lads and all of that, but actually it's how do you change the, the experience of people when they're making those micro journeys between school and home, uh, between local, local shops uh, uh, in, in the borough. And so this is, I think, really uh, important. That, does mean, though, that we are investing more in segregated cycling as well. We also thought about, well, what, 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 what are our streets for? They're not just to travel through. So we've got three policies that I think fundamentally change how you think about the urban environment. And they, they started with our work around play streets. It was about saying, actually, children and young people should be able to play safely outside of their home. So grassroots movement led by parents, led by neighbours, closing their streets, building on the experience in Bristol uh, uh, and Edinburgh. And really the council is a neighbourer. Uh, then we developed school streets, 
which was closing streets around our schools at school, pick up and drop offs. I promised five, we're now talking about 17, but actually they've been so successful, we're gonna actually basically make it an opt out program for our schools because it fundamentally, it, it reduces microaggression around schools, it moves pollution away, it it's really encourages people um, to walk with their children, to walk with their friends, and from 2008 to now, we've halved the number of people that go by car uh, to, to, to do the school run. And that's a tremendous driver of uh, air pollution. And then we've been thinking about, well, why are we saying that our streets are just there for parking cars in? So we've been introducing CPZs uh, across the borough with emission controlled parking zones by consent. Um, uh, and introducing emissions-based charging. We're about to take that onto our housing estates, but in a progressive way, making sure that we uh, take, take residents uh, with us. Uh, but we've developed parklets, which is where residents, instead of having a parking permit to park a car, get to reclaim a bit of the street uh, and green it. And I think, again, it, they're small changes, but they make people think about their neighbour in a different way. And they bring communities together. In, in ways, and so people have a conversation with what could our street be like if it wasn't dominated um, by cars. And it's not a one-size-fits-all town hall dumpster thing uh, in the middle of the street and says, no, it's actually people designing those things themselves. We put in a bit of funding, people do some crowdfunding, and they, get, they change that nature of, of how they think about their streets. We've been working with business as well, and this is, I think, really important to say, partnership is important. Working with the Mayor of London, working with other boroughs, working with business in what we call our zero emissions networks. We've got one in the city fringe, we're just about to expand them to two other sites uh, in, in the rest of Hackney and that came way before the kind of ULES that's now rolled around to the ultra low emission zone in central London and it was how do you take businesses through being more green, more sustainable, um, changing out their vehicles for uh, low emission or zero emission vehicles, thinking about cargo bikes for delivery, how, uh, thinking about secure bike parking, getting showers into businesses, a really pro-business act and actually it's improved the parts of the borough's air quality where we've done that. They started a movement then to create what we call our low emission streets, so we closed some streets in, uh, in Islington and Hackney on the city borders, anything other than the most uh, low emission vehicles at, at rush hour and that was, uh, I say, a prelude to the ULETs. Um, but it was, again, grassroots. It was town halls showing leadership, but actually communities saying, no, we'll shut those streets, we'll get involved in that, in that way. We also pushed to get the ULES expansion to the North Circular to make sure that we were not seeing, back to the Hoxton example, that central London would see its air cleaned up and all of that would pass through the poor communities in Hackney uh, and see their air quality uh, get, get worse. We um, declared a climate change emergency uh, this year, but it was building on existing work and thinking about how we supercharge it. So one of the other challenges I think all of us face is how we green our infrastructure. That's essential to remove particulates from the air. So we had a thousand street trees is what I promised. We're going to be rolling out a program this autumn to trip more than triple that and create the largest tree uh, planting program in a generation in Hackney, building on very strong foundations already of uh, substantial sort of investment in street trees. That cools the air, it makes it a better environment for people, and it also deals with some of the particular air pollution. Um, all of it really about how we change our urban environment uh, to make it better for children and young people uh, in, in Hackney. And I suppose I just sort of finished that you can do an incredible amount with very small interventions. You know, big cycling schemes are very expensive. It's absolutely right that people like Labour Cycles are campaigning for when we get in government uh, uh, sustainable transport to be at the heart of any infrastructure plan. But two bollards can remove food traffic from an estate. And that is just as important as creating superhighways. It's just as important to create somewhere to securely park your bike <coughs> as it is to create that kind of heavy infrastructure. Because if you cycle to anywhere and you can't park it, you're not going to take that journey uh, again. You don't encourage people to shop locally. Uh, and, and so, you know, people's experiences of these things, I think uh, they, it's based on their last sort of act. Uh, and I, I went back from conference yesterday and I saw the real power of when you close a street permanently. We had a car-free day uh, across uh, London and we closed one of our biggest high streets. And, you know, the weather wasn't great, 
but people really embraced the idea that this was their street. It wasn't to be choked with pollution. It wasn't to be uh, rat run through. It was a place that was at the heart of their community again. And I think that is why this issue is so important and why it's Labour's issue, because we believe in community, social justice, socialism, and ultimately cleaning our air and saving this planet. And I think that's what we can do at all levels of the Labour Party. Thank you so much. That's really interesting, because they're very, very different approaches, because you've got different sort of powers. And I think what would be useful to get a sense from both of you about how do you deal with resistance and how do you build that public consent and support? I mean, I know that bit that you're talking about in terms of the, car the, the, calm, the traffic calming areas in the ward in which I represent. We've got pictures of people on the estate in the 60s saying, close this road because it, it was a rat run and the, kids and the people on the estate didn't have cars. So they saw this absolutely as a class issue, frankly, and they said they wanted those, those closed. I don't know whether that would be quite the same now. How do you manage that building support and dealing with resistance? Steve, have you got any thoughts? It's very difficult, isn't it, in all honesty, because um, I think people's expectations are that because you're a mayor, there's a magic wand and you really can't do everything that you'd like to do. And, and I think if we start looking at what we need to do just as a piecemeal thing, you're going to miss what you can achieve overall. It needs to be much more holistic uh, than that. Um, air quality, for instance, in our area, is affected by the growth in um, the visitor economy. And we want to grow the visitor economy, but that means that we'll have cruise liners coming in. And cruise liners, just been speaking to somebody from Southampton, same there, cruise liners are really, really dirty. So when we build a new cruise liner facility, wouldn't it be great if there was um, a plug-in mechanism that ships could come in and they wouldn't need to put their diesel engines on, but they could use renewable energy to power that ship? Well, that's the way we're thinking. So we have to think about little tiny interventions because they're really important, but also big things that can affect everything that you do. And, um, when I was well, like, for example, if you're going to if you're going to really clean up the air, you're going to have to tackle private hire cars and taxi drivers. Now we know what happens. Loads of cities have dealt, have had that, tried to do that, and they've had go slow taxi drivers yeah. blocking up the whole of the town centre. Yeah. How do you how do you anticipate managing that, and and what what do you start to do to prepare the the ground so that people understand why you're doing it? and how you're going to be able to relieve the pressure. Because there is a social justice issue if you're threatening their jobs or making it harder for them to do the right thing. Yeah. But congestion is slightly different than all of the other aspects of air pollution. If, if, they, were <laughs> elect, if they were electric vehicles, uh, taxis, for instance, that would stop some of the issues that we've got in the city centre. It, we're not London, um, and, but we do have um, real, real serious air quality issues but only in certain corridors, and that's what we need to start to address first. Um, but for instance, I, I, I'm with Sadiq, uh, we went to, uh, came to London on the train, um, and we had that big conference, and we put forward, I think, really responsible um, asks of government, which included the scrappage system for um, really air pollutant taxis. Well, we can do that locally, you know. It, it, it just, we just need government to work with us, um, and a Labour government will, of course. And, but th this lot are never going to um, favour areas like ours. Well, I think what's the interesting thing as well is that when we did the analysis on on a diesel scrappage scheme, we worked out that it actually would benefit the economy. Yeah. People will always say that health health investment is a cost. But actually, we can we can uh, generate further stuff. You know, you've obviously you've had a different thing because it's been very grassrootsy, but it's not without its resistance. So how have you managed that? Well, absolutely. I think transition has to be fair, as as we've been saying. Mm. I think it will be a lot hard whenever I get into sort of Twitter spat with traffic uh, with taxi drivers or business about that. It is it is referencing back that I believe in that sort of scrappage scheme. And there should be government support for it. I think you know what, what the mayor has been asking for is really uh, important. Having something like the Zero Emissions Network where business is talking to business about the benefits of this, and it is a positive business story, not a negative one, 
I think you then have to be a little bit ahead of the debate as well. So making sure that if we're going to see that movement to uh, EV vehicles around delivery, you know, there are a lot of people that are in the trades that live on Hackney Estates. If there are no EV charging points, because people assume that people on estates don't need them, or they've been just clustered on sort of middle-class streets, then you're not ready for when that AA driver's van switches to EV because they can't park it where they live. So we're going to be investing in a bigger rollout of EV. I do think everyone, though, does need to be honest. We cannot transition to the same type of economy that we have now and just switch it to electric. We, don't, you know, we do not want to see all of our streets clogged up with electric vehicles. They're not emitting... Uh, uh, pollution, but they're still admitting particulates, they're still taking up space, they're not going to encourage the active travel. So switching is not enough, and I think there needs to be a bit of a more sophisticated uh, argument around our, uh, our sort of Green New Deal language at a national level, because we don't just want, you know, it'd be great if, you, uh, you know, a British Land Rover EV, fantastic, but actually you don't want the school run in a Land Rover at all. Um, even if it's an EV one. So, um, but on, on, on building, you know, I, I do think we need to do consultation in new ways. There's points for leadership and making decisions. I think you really, really, really have to do that. But there, it can be really hard to take people with you around street closures. And there's really, you know, see the campaigns against Mini Hollands in Waltham Forest, see some of the campaigns against those sorts of changes. Uh, in Hackney. But then you've also got to listen, pause, reflect, and maybe redesign. There was nothing more frustrating than being a Hoxton councillor and getting the transport engineers coming to my ward and saying, look at the shiny thing we want to do. And they just hadn't shut the other rat run that wasn't quite in there. You know, you, you have to be able to be flexible and listen to people about what they want to see change in their area because otherwise people aren't going to treat you with any credibility and it was really common when we were knocking on doors for people to say so you want to tackle air pollution but there's a diesel council van parked outside my house every morning um, because the driver's waiting for his first job you can't you, you must deal with your own idling and your own fleet and that's why we're investing in our own fleet and our new fleet won't allow that idling because people don't think you have any credibility if you if a hackney council van is polluting their kids and, and I think that it's about being able to sort of come back on those sorts of issues and show that leadership at a level. Uh, uh, a level. And being able to, I suppose, roll with the punches a little bit. You are, by acting, you are going to be making a decision and some people aren't going to like it. And we have to be brave uh, on this agenda and do that. And how do you work, Steve, with the, with the six boroughs underneath you? Because that's one of those things. You might not have a lot of fleet yourself, but those six boroughs could be like Hackney. How do you ma make that your potential for quite a strong amount of power with your colleagues in, at borough level make a big switch so that they're, they're sending the right message? I actually think we've got six very <coughs> progressive councils, so they want to do this voluntarily. So it's not <coughs> the Metro Mayor telling them what to do. I actually think most councils, most Labour can control councils, all six are in, in our area. But they want to do these things. So when we talk about um, how we can tackle some of those issues that we have, you know, which result in when I used to get on the train um, from where I lived and ended up in the place where I worked in, in the Commons, the life expectancy was 15 yeah. years difference. Well, when, you, when people start to think about the consequences of it's not just a bit of dirty air, the health implications of what people are doing, <coughs> it's not then just about tree huggers and lentil eaters. It's, it's much more real and tangible to people's lives. And I think that's how... Um, you can get people on side, but of course, there's also the fiscal imperative, isn't it? When, when you start to say, by doing that, overall, you can save money, then that's also a driver. I wish it wasn't, I wish it was for ethical reasons, but at the end of the day, the likes of Treasury don't listen to ethics or morals. They listen to Green Book and, you know, business cases and BCRs and stuff like that. Well, we can prove by doing stuff that actually you can save Treasury money but by doing it a different way. But also, for your residents, if you ha aren't on a particularly good bus route, you do aspire to having a car, because having a car is still a strong symbol of ambition and success and so forth. D you don't want to end up in a sort of Norman Tebbit position of telling them to get on their bike from Speak into town. That wouldn't be a great look. How do you shift the way that people... How do you offer alternatives 
to the ways that currently they would ex people would expect to say, do you know what, that's going to be the best way for me to protect my kids, get them to school on time, show everyone else that I'm successful, which is what a lot of the car culture is about, and say, actually, this is going to be good for you, going to be good for your kids, be, uh, you'll, you'll be healthier and you'll be safer. That's a lot of things to offer if all you're doing is offering a bike. I mean, I don't know, is it, is it car clubs? Are there other ways of doing these things that but, might but work? The, the answer's in the question, isn't it? If you provide a genuine quality alternative, so for instance, on our, our trains, um, we've thought that on the old trains now, you get two bikes on, because we allow cycles uh, on them, but that's it, you can't get on off. And if you've got a wheelchair user or a mum or dad with a push chair, all sorts of things happen. So working with cyclists, we've got bike racks on our new trains where they stand up and you can get a lot more, you can stack them. And so we're thinking about how we interconnect all the things that we're doing instead of, we'll just build some trains, which are really lovely. Um, we then want the interconnectivity between those cycles and cycle lanes to stations. So we're starting to build a much more holistic view of how we can attract people to modal shift away from car mm -hmm. into alternatives. And the other one is on, on the buses. If we had London style subsidies to sell the street, we can get more people out of cars. But at the moment, it's four quid on a, one of our buses, a single journey. I think it's 150, isn't it, in, in London? Everything, four quid. Anywhere. And we can't cap them because they're all different companies. So you get on one bus, and that might, might not take you to work. If you get on the next bus, it's four quid as well. So it's eight quid to get on. So we're looking at a smart ticketing so that we can start to cap fares so we can get more people by providing the quality alternative. And that, that's, I think that's how you can start to address some of those I, concerns. I, 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 couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. Like I, I said this at a, a fringe uh, in, uh, Earlier in the year, I, I grew up in a in a in Worcester suburban town. Used to have a good bus service, and I cycled a lot. And then the second I turned 18, I went out and bought a car because I wanted a car. And I go back now, and my mum on a route that used to have six buses an hour gets one. Uh, and that's the decimation of public transport options in a relatively wealthy city that could run far better. And if it was in uh, any of our continental uh, countries would have a flourishing bus system and really good access to cycling and, uh, and the rest. So, you know, people were living a life that was much closer to the life we want people to live back then, and it's just gone. And now the only way you can get around is getting a, a, a car or a taxi. So mm -hmm. I didn't, like, arrive with a kind of hackney kind of um, a culture around walking and cycling. You, you move to Hackney and, and you see that it can work, and I think it then sort of infects you in a really positive way. But that wasn't natural, you know, I'm a... You know, suburban Midland person that drove, drove a car and, and, and did all the rest. So it's not like I've been a cyclist all my sort of <laughs> life. But I do think you also have to normalise the fact that 60% of people in Hackney don't have access to a private car. So in the debate that you're having at Hustings, where people are sort of, you're anti-car, no, it's being, saying you're pro-people and pro the average Hackney resident that doesn't have an access to a car. And if you do need a car the more people I shift away from cars. So if you are living with a disability or you've got a large family or you're a business person, you reduce congestion by getting other people out of their vehicles. Mm. You don't reduce congestion mm. by building more roads or encouraging other people to get onto those roads by making car access easier. And there are boroughs in London where they have parking permit systems where you can park anywhere for three hours for, for free if you have a parking permit. Ours are all zonally set out, which means that you don't have those under a mile journeys because you can't go and park in that, that other zone. And again, that just, just reduces you know, demands on our road system. The other thing that happens, though, uh, which is different in London than anywhere else, is that I, I, I lived in Pimlico, so I'd come out and I'd walk to Pimlico, and, but I'd walk past bus stops outside the Lord's End where Lords would be getting on buses yeah. along with the cleaners and the Lords mm -hmm. and everybody else and in our area, buses are seen to be the, like the working class alternative, you know what I mean? And our buses are brilliant. So the leather seats, Wi-Fi, tellies in them, tables, you know, they're really, really good standard, but they're still seen to be, that's the poor end. So we need a cultural shift to start to say to people, actually, you know, this in other places in the country, London, this is the norm, we get on buses. If we can then attract them on, 
that's where we can start to drive down costs as well. There's so much to talk about. I want to open it up to everybody because we haven't got very much more time. So what I'm, I'm really strict on this. I'm just warning you now. Should have, should have warned you earlier, right? I want questions, not observations. Literally, any observations, and I'll just ask you to sit down. Questions, not observations. I'll take th at least three at a time, and I will prioritise women. You know why? Because women don't talk enough about transport, and then it gets designed wrong. All right, lads? OK, <laughs> so, lady at the front, um, and then the gentleman behind her in the red T-shirt, and then the gentleman at the back with the beard, right? One question each. Can you tell us who you are and where you're from? Um, Man Mandy from Hemel Hempstead CLP. Um, do you think a four-day week will help contribute towards reducing our air quality problem? Great question. <coughs> Gentleman with the, with the red T-shirt. Hi, uh, Eddie from uh, Gower CLP. We've got a, a, a transport group in our branch. Um, I was interested, well, you, you mentioned uh, resistance and you, you sort of gave some advice on that. Um, there's obviously uh, resistance, but there's a carrot and stick approach, and you mentioned controlled uh, parking and CCT for cameras. Now, could you give a little bit more on information on that, and is that available through UK 100? Okay. And then the gentleman in the back with the beard. Uh, Stephen Carter from Bermondsey and Old Southwark CLP. From which CLP? Bermondsey and Old Southwark, okay. yeah. Uh, so just to ask um, about the, the sort of political structure aspects of this, um, what powers do you think uh, cities and regions need to be able to really effectively tackle uh, these air pollution and transport uh, issues? And how do you balance that with ensuring it is integrated into a national strategy and national systems? Fantastic questions. See, if you keep your focus on questions, they're great. So, four-day week, both of you. Can you talk about the powers and can you talk about CPZs? Mm -hmm. Is that all right? So do you want to start, Steve? Okay, um, four-day week for a whole host of things, yes. I mean, <laughs> of course we should. Um, we spend far too long at work uh, and not enough um, with family, so you've got to get the work-life uh, work balance right. But um, if people aren't travelling to work, just like in a school holiday when, if you're trying to get into um, Liverpool, for instance, when there's a school holiday, it's so much easier because the school run's not taking place and mums and dads aren't driving that one mile, um, which we hopefully then can attract them not to do that um, in the future. Four days means that you've got a 20% reduction in the amount of people who be probably jumping in cars. So, yeah, for, for those reasons, um, I'm sure there'll be arguments from... Um, the other side saying about affordability and all that, but France and other areas have, have managed to uh, reduce the work and week. Why can't we? What about the question about powers? Because you've got some specific powers that other metro mayors don't have, and that does create some opportunities, doesn't it? Yeah, and some threats. Um, we, we've got um, spatial development powers, so uh, instead of transport being siloed, which it has been, you know, just Sat, sat there and people did little bits around it. We can start to build transport into our thinking around housing, around health, around culture, um, all of those big offers. Uh, and um, we are going to use them. There's an old saying, um, there's an old adage um, that scousers learn to read between the lines before they read words. Um, <laughs> so, in my devolution agreement, it, it tells me things I can do. But there's no way does it say, and you can't do this, this, and this. <laughs> um, so I'm doing it anyway, to tell you the truth. And I'm waiting for them to knock on the door saying, what the hell are you doing here? We're just, we're just doing it. I think that's a great adage for anybody who's got any local power at the moment. Just get on and do it anyway. So, Phil, what would you say? Uh, I think four-day week, for the very reasons that, that Steve said, I think it, it's beneficial. People obviously working from home as well has an impact on kind of... Um, uh, on on drive, but if you if you, I think that it, school run contributes a lot. Even at, even even the low levels in Hackney, you notice when it's a school um, holiday. Where I also think we have to also be a bit honest is we've got uh, we're starting to get quite addicted to things like Deliveroo, Uber, 
uh, and Amazon Prime. And a lot of the vehicle journeys now are delivery journeys. We need to think about what that economy looks like to consolidate it. So people might be staying at home, but if then they're if they're just accessing all of those things, there's lots of deliveries going around our communities, um, you know, and, and again, um, you know, people going, you know, shopping delivered. So I think a lot of what is happening on our roads, certainly in London, isn't just people driving uh, or uh, to, to work. Uh, on Eddie's point for the Gower about um, carrots and sticks, I think it, there was an element that, the, well, as I said, CPZs have been bought in where people have wanted them because they don't want commuters driving into their neighbourhoods and then parking up and then getting tra public transport into the centre of town. So we've actually built them bottom up. They, don't, they have different hours. Some of them reflect being near town centres. You know, it's the problem you're trying to sort of solve. We do a lot of work around encouraging cycling in terms of free events, free trials, free training. So a lot of the income, transport income, is spent on sustainable transport. So I don't, I can't, I can't, you know, do stuff around public transport. That's the Mayor of London. But we are making those sorts of interventions that see sort of positive um, change and working with children and young people as well to get them into the habit of cycling. So we do a big um, bike around the borough day uh, every year where we shut a rolling road closure program and take all of our primary schools uh, children on a sort of 10 mile cycle around the borough. People actually go to places they've never been, which is like to hear children say, I didn't know I could cycle to the park. I'd never thought about doing that. Uh, and so it's that sort of positive reinforcement about what sustainable transport can do. Can I just say on new powers, um, I do think that we, you know, Brexit has really meant that a lot of the kind of things that we would want coming out of central government just simply haven't happened. We've seen a bit of movement on play streets and the regulation around closing roads in, in a few recent weeks, but there's a huge task, I think, of devolution to city region level, to metro mayors around powers. So I would like the power to regulate um, uh, speed enforcement mm. because I think you can change. We've still got a lot of roads in the east of Hackney that lead into the sort of motorway network and people come off those roads and they, they go into one-way systems. They still think they're on a motorway. And you can have 20 mile an hour zones, but if you can't enforce them, mm. uh, maybe with some differential speed cameras, it's convincing the police to invest the resources in there. I think road charging, 40% uh, of journeys in Hackney don't start or end in the borough still. Uh, so people are still driving through. Back to that Hoxton experience. We're going to have to deal with some of the through traffic because not everyone in London's taken the steps that we've, we've taken. I'd love them to do that. But again, I don't want my residents living uh, with toxic air created by somebody else. So I think there needs to be a bit of a movement uh, on that as well and thinking about the powers that we need to shape our communities in the way that we, we need to. Great. Now, I'm supposed to be at another event, but because we've run, we started late, I'm just going to have to start late again. So I'm going to take three more questions, uh, again, very uh, briefly. Um, the lady there in the blue, the lady there in the grey, and the, the gentleman there in the check shirt. Hi, um, I'm Adele Barnett-Ward. I'm a Reading Borough Councillor. I'm chair of our Strategic Environment Planning and Transport Committee, and I'm also founding chair of our Cleaner Air and Tra Safer Transport Forum, so I am a woman who talks about transport quite a lot. Um, I wanted to pick up on what you were saying, Steve, about just get on with it and what you were saying, Bill, about resistance to things. Um, something that we've looked at is using our Play Street scheme to sort of trial modal filtering and expanding that out. And I'm wondering, is that, a, this is really, sorry, this is very much for me, is, the, is that a good idea, do you think, or is it better just to whack the bollards in and do we actually have time to, to softly, softly approach things? Great. Lady at the, at the door with the grey dress on. Great top on, sorry. I wanted to ask about the impact of something other than transport. Where are you from, sorry? What's so I'm from Ealing. Right. And I wanted to ask about the impact of development on air quality, because we're suffering in Ealing from massive um, development, flats going up everywhere and so on. And there's a particular problem in Southall where people are being literally poisoned from the building works that are going on to local former gas works. Um, and my concern is, although this is reported to the council, it's been reported to the Environmental Health Authority, it's been reported in the press, it's been everywhere, nothing, absolutely nothing is being done about it. Okay, great. Gentleman there with the check shirt. I think there's a mic coming that way. Thank you. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Steve Leggett, Southampton City Council, Cabinet Member for... Speak up a bit, Steve. Um, Steve Leggett, Councillor, Southampton City Council, Cabinet Member for Green City. 
uh, air quality fits in my portfolio. Uh, a question for Steve about cruise liners. We've got very similar um, issues in Southampton. Um, you talked about renewables with, with shore power. I mean, first, we need to get the infrastructure in first. It's £6.3 million pounds to do that. And as you know, we tried to get the government to pay for that, and they declined to do it. The other thing I was very interested in is your order for hydrogen buses. If you can give me a bit more information about that. Great. So hydrogen buses, issues around construction. And do you just do it, or do you need to do a more softly, softly approach? Um, can you do hydrogen buses and um, yep. for, and to begin with? Up. Yeah, go on. Yeah, well, um, the hydrogen buses are, uh, I think, um, the first fleet of its kind in, in the country, and they uh, we're buying them, but they're going to be run by the bus operating companies. So you can you can understand why they're going. Yeah, it sounds like a great idea because they're getting brand new buses um, with uh, low emission, well zero emissions. But we need to start somewhere. And um, as I say, if we use the powers in the bus services bill, then who knows? what might happen to um, the, the bus operating companies in the future. Um, that's all I'm saying. Because only, only because if anyone tweets out, if there's predetermination of what the outcome of that process will be, then they'll use that in court against us. So you can all tweet and say, we are going to re-regulate, but I never used the word franchise, did I? OK. Um, <laughs> on on the, the cruise line stuff, um, we're building a new cruise liner terminal and we've put 20 million pounds as a combined authority into that cruise liner terminal and that's the reason that I'm saying that we need to be thinking ahead and future proofing and if we are going to get renewable energy from the River Mersey that will be owned by us wouldn't it be a better solution to use renewable energy to power those cruise liners when they're laid up overnight so that's it, it'll mean that we're going to have to invest more money but we'll do that. We're not waiting for this government to do anything. Um, if we do get a Labour government, John's been up to see me and Becky and, and everyone, and they've said um, we can have £3.5 billion for the, the, um, the tidal scheme. So if we're getting £3.5 billion for a tidal scheme, we'll put £6.5 million into a plug. Great. Construction, please, and whether you'd need to do softly, softly, or just get on with it. Yeah, we don't have a cruise line terminal. <laughs> In Hackney? No. <laughs> Springfield Marina. Springfield Marina, yeah. Well, both, both pollution from both things <coughs> is quite an interesting one. So I think um, Wolf and Forest did some quite good work, I think, around Millie Holland, of just putting down um, a concrete um, uh, planters and things to sort of show what those streets could be look, look like. I think you know, it's an absolutely right... You start a conversation with a street in a neighbourhood and you can do that by planting some trees, you can do that by doing a parklet, you can do that by a school street or play street and then I think the conversation continues on from there because people A, get to know each other, they can see the sort of hope and change on offer and then they can come up with some of those ideas. I think we also have to be a bit honest and trial stuff. If it's a pilot and it doesn't work, change the hours do some other things, not, not carrying on regardless. And I, and, and I think there's been a bit of that. If we say yes to this and it does all the things we fear, they're not going to go back on it. And if we can try and encourage that actually some of these things are a bit more temporary to start with, the dangers are that sometimes, a bit like the stuff in De Beauvoir, it was te it, it's been left kind of temporary 30, 40 years on uh, uh, and you could have some better urban realm. So uh, on building, we've had a very similar experience uh, in Hackney Wick, uh, light industrial land, uh, really, really terrible pollutants, air pollution coming out of it. Both LLDC and Hackney, they were very proactive in stopping the works and making sure that we'd done the work with local residents to convince them that resuming the works was, was safe. I think there's all sorts of uses of construction, um, markets, ice cream vans, all sorts of things that we need to get into thinking about their impact on air pollution. Because anything that involves a diesel generator, you know, Carnival, you know, these things, uh, you want, once you start thinking about it, can have a really big impact. S the street food movement, you know, all of that, and it goes back to cruise, cruise line. We've got to think about how we do that in a way that reduces pollution um, for people that are around construction uh, like that. I don't think we've cracked it in Hackney, 
but I think it's something that we need, do need to focus on. And again, that's probably something we need national leadership, where there's some work with the construction industry to, to develop greener ways of constructing. Which comes a great way for us to end uh, the, today's session. Thank you. Can we just have a quick, brief round of applause for both of our speakers? Phil's point about the importance of national action on this is particularly apposite because whether we leave the European Union or not, we are due to have an environment bill. Everybody in this room needs to be pressing this national government to commit to World Health Organization limits on air pollution because without that, we will not be able to tackle particularly the particulate matter which um, impacts on our lungs and, and other parts of our bodies, where they have found particulate matter on the other side of the placenta in fetuses. We know that this is a public health crisis and this government can do something about it. Michael Gove, who is not normally a friend in this particular arena, actually in his last speech as DEFRA Secretary of State, said that he thought that Environment Bill should have those limits in it. It, would, should, it should also include stuff like diesel generators, construction, and those static um, and engines too, because we cannot underestimate the kind of impact this is having on our health and on our children's health. So can I thank you so much for your contributions and thoughtful questions this afternoon. Um, thank again our contributors, and thank Sarah for hosting this afternoon's event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.